Fora TV. The world is thinking. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, my name is Karen Edelman. I am also I am one of the operators of Saul's Restaurant in Delicatessen. Thanks for having me tonight. <laughs> we are very pleased to host Michael Pollan, Gil Friend, Willow Rosenthal in a conversation with Evan Kleiman on sustainability in the Jewish deli. Uh, many thanks to the Jewish Community Center of the East Bay for offering to share your space. I would also like to acknowledge um, Amuna Hauser, who helped produce and publicize this event. She is a um, sustainability warrior, <laughs> and without her, this event would never have happened. <laughs> I, also want to, I also want to mention that the proceeds from this event go to the Center for Eco-Literacy, and they have a table outside, and they're a great institution. Um, they're supporting and advancing education on sustainability. I recommend you go check that out. And um, I lost my second page, one second. Okay, so we're calling this a referendum. And um, why referendum? Um, it's when a body, in this case one deli, poses a question to people on issues that will affect them. Um, sometimes the results are binding. This is not one of those cases. <laughs> um, and while we are not yet a fully democratic institution, we are hoping that by opening up the conversation, um, that we have around our deli to a wider audience, we may all contribute to this cuisine that we, that we care so much about. Uh, many, many people have a stake in this shared cuisine, the Jewish delicatessen, and we all have a role to create a more sustainable, vibrant, and just food system. That's true. So we've convened a panel of people with a stake in our deli, and we've called upon some of our august customers to come and talk about sustainability. Um, economic, cultural, and environmental sustainability. Sustainability and the deli. Um, let me introduce our moderator, Evan Kleiman. We're very lucky to have her here. She's from KCRW. She does the radio show Good Food, and she also is the proprietor of Cafe Angeli, and she's come here to help us facilitate. I also wanted to let you know at the last minute here that we are, um, we are streaming this live to the restaurant, and if you want to leave now, I think there's only a 20 or 30 minute wait, so you're welcome <laughs> to go. Um, Evan, why don't you go ahead. Well, I think I want to start with a, a little personal thought here. Um, I live with my 90-year-old mother, or she lives with me. Um, she's a Russian Jew who grew up in South Philly. And occasionally I look at the shopping list on our refrigerator, and I see the items there. And I'm struck by the gulf between her comfort food and therefore a lot of my comfort food. And um, what I know to be cutting edge philosophy about sustainable, healthy food, yet there they are on the list every week, making the mouth water, Hebrew national salami, lox, cream cheese, sour cream pastrami, jars of beet borscht, herring, and gefilte fish. You get the picture. And here we are, lovers of foods that are embedded in our souls, food intellectuals and activists who know what we love, well, has some issues. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what these amazing panelists have to say about this, because I think this is a subset of the whole sustainable conversation that really hasn't been opened up to a larger discussion, and I'm sure this will be just the beginning. Um, we'll start with Michael, Paulin. The man who more than anyone else, I think, has framed the conversation about sustainable versus industrial food in this country, journalist, and of course, author of Botany of Desire, and Omnivore's Dilemma, and most recently, Food Rules. I also think that much of Michael's most important writing of late are his opinion pieces in the New York Times and other periodicals. Gil Friend is a strategic sustainability consultant, the CEO of Natural Logic. Clients uh, have included Dean Foods, Nike, Coca-Cola, and Williams Sonoma. Author of The Truth About Green Business, Gil was recently named one of the Bay Area's top 25 clean tech movers and shakers. And right next to me here is the very famous Willow Rosenthal. You are a farmer, founder of City Slicker Farms, which increases food self-sufficiency in West Oakland by creating organic, sustainable, high-yield urban farms and backyard gardens. And then, of course, at the end there, we have our, our 
lovely hosts, Karen and Peter. So before I start off with you, I would like to just go down the panel and ask, what would you cry <laughs> if you were told you couldn't eat it anymore? That comes from the pantheon of Jewish deli foods. Willow. Thank you. Um, well, I do have a confession to make here tonight, which is that I am a uh, pastrami addict. And as a farmer, of course, um, to me, for some strange reason, people always assume I'm a vegetarian. I don't know why. So <laughs> It's good I, to know. Yeah, I, I, I do grow vegetables. I eat vegetables, but doesn't mean I don't eat meat. So um, I love the pastrami Reuben. And actually, I have been eating at Sal's for many years. I moved here in 1997 to this area. And as, the san as their sandwiches have changed a little bit, um, I feel a little more comfortable after, after eating one of those sandwiches now. <laughs> and I feel a little less disgusted with myself. And I feel very, very, very satisfied. G Gil? Well, my, my first immediate answer was olive oil. And some people would say, what's that got to do with deli? But that's some of what we're going to talk about tonight, I suppose. Uh, when I go back to the traditional deli menu, it's, it's matzo ball soup, hands down. Especially, Sinkers or floaters? Uh, so, not, so light they don't just float in the soup, they float above the bowl. <laughs> Michael? Yeah, I was going to say the chicken soup. I mean, uh, certainly on the Sal's menu, that's the thing that if, if it weren't there, I would be very disappointed. And not necessarily the matzo ball soup, which I like that, though, but the chicken in a pot with the actual pieces of chicken. Um, you know, I have a lot of memories of, of, of getting containers of that to bring home to my son when he was sick. It was like it always did the trick. And uh, um, so I'd have to say that would be the one. Karen? Um, well, I've eaten there every day for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know what that's like. <laughs> but no, but I'm not tired of the food. Um, and I go through phases. And uh, I guess lately I'm into um, winter salads. It's not. <coughs> it's always a telly item, but it's something I eat there every day. So. Peter? <clears throat> I taste the, uh, I, one of my main jobs is to taste all the food, so every single morning and again in the afternoon I'll taste pastrami. Um, herring, I love herring, and I can't imagine anyone will ever take it away from me. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter and Karen, why don't you start off by telling us why you have us here today? Briefly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll start. Okay, start. Uh, well, there's there's two reasons. One is that um, we have we have um, the Jewish deli mission, which I think anybody who's ever loved or been to a Jewish deli knows. I don't have to tell you what that is. And we've had a we've had a secret stealth mission, um, which has become less stealth over time. And um, the reason for coming is to marry the two, and. We wanted to be um, part of the solution, and instead of part of the problem. And we wanted, um, we wanted to sell meat, and, and this happened a long time ago. We wanted to sell meat that we we didn't want to sell meat that we wouldn't eat, and so we wanted to increasingly marry the two, and um, and, and it, we could do that in a stealth way for a long time. But we've come to kind of a place where it's not possible to do that anymore. And in fact we have to be very explicit and we need permission to go further um, to make the Jewish deli cuisine actually a living, breathing cuisine to drag it out of the uh, museum. And, and wh why do you need permission? It, do you plan on doing something radical with the menu that you anticipate will cause upset? <laughs> <laughs> well, n no, I mean a, a deli menu is very long. It's every day of the year you can walk in and demand anything you want and we'll say yes, 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 of course, right away. And I think that in a restaurant it isn't as good if you do that. It isn't as tasty, it's not possible, it's not seasonal. We will have everything, but maybe in its time. So the idea is um, to get permission from our patrons to, to have the deli cuisine breathe like the seasons. And so perhaps you'll have a cold borscht in the summer and a hot borscht in the winter. Um, that means radical. no chilled borscht in December. <laughs> radical, <laughs> radical notions like that. And what role does your staff have in this endeavor to educate people? And at what point, I want to go to Gil after, 
does this whole issue of education about something so direct mm -hmm. as what you put in your mouth yeah, um, our staff. come to play? Our staff, they, they really do wind up having to talk quite a bit at the table. Um, does that make people angry? I don't think angry is the right word. Oh, well, it's unfair, <laughs> it's unfair of us uh, as restaurateurs and as a community to expect them to bear the brunt of this permission that we're asking. You know, we do, they shouldn't have to explain why there's no borscht, chilled borscht, on a wintry December night. Which isn't a crisis, because there are four other soups. So, <laughs> just keep that in mind. Yet for the person who says, well, why don't you just keep a couple jars of borscht in the refrigerator so when I come in, you'll have it for me? I think there are jars. <laughs> Somewhere in the Yeah, they're for a few years old, but you could... <laughs> <laughs> the, the, there's two or three kinds of rye, or we, you know, should we keep the other two kinds? And there's two or three kinds of matzo ball. Should we have floaters and sinkers? When we all know we try every day to achieve uh, floaters. It's, it's, yeah, it's not, it's not how a restaurant runs. The larger the menu is, the more problematic it is to run the restaurant. And more expensive. Um, actually, I'm going to hold off on asking you that question. And I want to talk for a minute about do you feel that what we have come to know as deli comfort food, particularly when it comes to the meats, the fatty, yielding, being able to cut it with a spoon kind of meat, was predicated on industrial production? Do you think what we're longing for when we have that comfort is something that can only be produced industrially? Michael. No, I think the restaurant is proving that that isn't the case, at least in, 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 some, in some examples, not everything. Um, and, you know, uh, roast beef is the, is the notable example and, and uh, that there is uh, grass-fed roast beef on the menu. I never had meat at the restaurant until they started having grass-fed meat on the, uh, on the menu. And, uh, you know, it can be done. I mean, you can do grass-fed pastrami and... Um, you can do uh, pastured chicken, and it all can be done. It's just more expensive, and I think that that's that's the kind of challenge that that um, Karen and Peter are talking about. Um, that there is a price. Um, you know what's what seems normal in in other delis has actually changed a lot. I mean, what seemed unchanging the pastrami, the roast beef, the the turkey, whatever it is, in fact has been revolutionized, like all the turkeys and all the beef in the last 50 years, and a lot of people didn't notice it. Um, but this is not the traditional product. This is not what was on the menu at the Second Avenue Deli in the in the 50s or even 60s. It's a really different product, and since it slipped into the food system more or less unnoticed, and in fact the price probably went down a little when it did, um, we've kind of accepted it. Um, but, uh, you know, meat was produced in a very different way 50 years ago. So it, now to get back to that way of producing meat takes a lot of work and extra money. Uh, it may not always be that way, um, but right now it is. And so I think a lot of the challenges, and, and, and this is another kind of permission, I guess, that you're, you know, one of the reasons we're here is how do people feel about that trade-off between having something of, of higher quality and, and that is more sustainable but that might be more expensive, or, or you'll get less of it. I mean, I think that that's the way you deal with that kind of issue. And, and there's a trade-off between quality and quantity in anything. So, so Gil, I know that you um, talk a lot about inexpense, inexpensive products are often um, mysteriously and ghostly inexpensive, that they actually cost quite a bit more. Could you talk about that in relationship? Yeah, we live in a world of hidden subsidies. Um, you know, this, this stuff looks more expensive because we're not paying the real costs of the industrialized agricultural system. It's subsidized with corn, it's subsidized with soil loss, it's subsidized with imported oil that's below its real price. Um, you know, you get, the, you get the food cheaper at the store, you pay for it in your health bills, and you pay for it in the state of agriculture in the country. Um, I mean, this is the... We, we go right at the start to the core issue in sustainability, which is getting the prices right. Um, uh, for, for a market system to work, and this is not my statement, this is Adam Smith's statement 225 years ago. Adam Smith was actually pretty astute and socially minded. You wouldn't know it from listening to Fox News. 
uh, but he said some very interesting things. And one of the things he said was that perfect markets depend on perfect information. Well, we have markets where we pay $3 a gallon at the pump for gasoline. We complain about that because it's too high, apparently. It's double that in Europe. But the real cost of a gallon of gasoline, if you take in the entire system, is probably 10 to $20 a gallon. So if you, know, if you had to pay $20 a gallon at the pump for gasoline, would you be driving the car you're driving today? Of course you wouldn't be. Would, would anybody be making the car you're driving today? Probably not. Would we be raising beef and chickens and vegetables and all the other things we do the way we do? Definitely not. Couldn't afford to do it. So, so let's, Peter, let's substitute gas in this example for the pastrami, the, the six-inch tall, towering <laughs> pastrami sandwich, which... We have some, Im we have some images that are going to go along with this. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That I think for a generation was sort of the mark of a break from grinding poverty to, um, to some level of affluence, the ability to be able to consume that sandwich. What does that sandwich cost? Um, Industrially and sustainably. In real terms, I think you can buy, if we sourced from the Cisco, the Jetros, the large warehouse distribution networks, it's $2 a pound for pastrami. Um, the Nyman Ranch, as an example, would be about $4, 4 50 4 60 a pound. Uh, Grass-fed is $6 a pound. Um, but the grass-fed has no, or very little, diesel cost in it because it's essentially local, Northern California raised, whereas the Nyman Ranch, which is four fifty, four sixty, is Western United States, and then the Jetro Cisco product, who knows where it comes from, Argentina, Mexico, the Midwest. But I think it should be said it's not just about money. It's about culture and identity, the sense of an authentic deli. Uh, you've been doing this thing all week about you have to go like this for the size <laughs> of the sandwich. And really? Really? Is this going to be the icon of, of the Jewish deli, a sandwich this size in these times? And I think we don't... I mean, clearly we have to eat less meat, and that seems strange from a professional pastrami hawker. But the <laughs> fact is, that you use a lot of other things to eat. And sure, sometimes go and have that sandwich. It's delicious. And both of but, yeah, not that one. <laughs> not that one. But ours, you know. It's still pornographic. It is I mean, pornographic. no matter how you look at it. See, I, oh, my God. I can't eat one of those. No, who can? Nobody I, can. I can't eat one of those, and I, you know, I, I'm either going to leave it, leave it to be thrown away, or I'm going to take it home for the next three days' worth of meals. And so my choice at the restaurant is if I could pay the same price for a smaller sandwich with better and more sustainable meat, I'm happy doing that. Yeah. Obviously, some people are not, and that's one of the issues. That it's a little controversial. And customers. the answer, if you really want to get down to it, and why we're here tonight, and David Sachs just published his book, Save the Deli, those sandwiches, those very images and iconic sandwiches are killing the deli. So what we're here tonight to talk about is how to save the deli. And the one way is to use really clean, really delicious meat and make the sandwich smaller. Why, why are those sandwiches killing the deli? Because it's just economics. If you, if you, if you go to a steakhouse and get a 10, 12-ounce steak, you're, you're forking out 30 or $40 in this country. You're probably getting a bottle of wine. In the Jewish deli, you're getting, you want to get the same number of ounces of meat um, from a cut of meat far more difficult to get it to your plate than a steak. Um, and you only want to pay $10 for it, or 15 maybe in New York City. Uh, and you don't drink a bottle of wine. So delis exist in the, the real world of real estate and uh, can make money selling pastrami sandwiches that are towering for 10 or 12 or $15. So we could help out by drinking bottles of wine in your room. Absolutely. <laughs> make a note of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make a small announcement. There, uh, the cards on your seats are for you to ask questions, which will then be um, be vetted for spam, <laughs> and, and then be passed up to me. So, it, it, as we go along, if there's a burning question or issue that you'd like to comment or ask, um, write it down on the on the. The There's a great uh, line from Richard Shepard, who was a, a, a great New York Times reporter who wrote the Around New York column for a while, and he said about, um, about these big sandwiches and going to a deli, um, when you eat this kind of food, 72 hours later, you're hungry again. <laughs> 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 uh, 
You know, I think it is important, though, also, like what you were saying, Karen, that um, why did people want those sandwiches? And where does that desire come from? It comes from coming from a situation of poverty and not being able to have your basic necessities. Mm -hmm. And so it's understandable that people want their comfort foods, but at what point do we say we are not in the same conditions that we were and things change and we evolve, our culture evolves, albeit very, very slowly. <laughs> um, but, and is that really helping us now to eat that sandwich? Well, earlier today, Peter and I were actually talking as fellow restaurateurs about um, the issue of our people <laughs> and, and food scarcity. That, that an abundant, I mean, I was taught growing up that wh when you served a meal, there had to be enough food left on the table to at least feed another two or three people if they happened to drop by. If there was just enough, then she would, my mother would just be horrified, feel appalled and ashamed. And, and a lot of people still hold on to that sort of sense of abundance as a mark of hospitality, I think, now beyond... Um, beyond you know, that, that we're, we're barely surviving. Now it's a mark of being a good host. But hospitality is one thing, and having so much food left over that it's thrown away is quite another. I mean, you know, the attachment to this stuff is that this, you know, people say this is tradition. You, know, you can't change the daily, it's traditional. This is the daily I grew up with. But what we take as traditional isn't traditional, it's relatively new. Right. Peter and Karen and I were talking last week, and I asked, you know, when is the deli of those foot-high sandwiches from? And it's from the 50s. It's from the post-war era. Right. And it's not about the deli. It's about post-war America, when everything went into excess. Everything went into reaction to the war and the depression that preceded it and the immigrant life that preceded that. And all of a sudden, there was top-of-the-world abundance, and it was cheap, and it was everywhere. And so people stepped into that with great enthusiasm, but that's not traditional in the sense, it's not, it's not what my dad grew up with. My dad grew up in New York eating at deli in the 1920s and 30s. This was not what they had. It's a very recent tradition. And if we really want to be traditional, we can look far, farther back right. into a tradition where, you know, really part of the Jewish tradition is that the traditions change. <laughs> <laughs> and also, why, do, why is it chicken soup? I mean, think about that, right? Why is chicken soup the tradition? That does not come from what you were just talking about. That comes from, we ate chicken, and now we need to make something else with what we have left over. We cannot mm -hmm. kill another animal tomorrow. We have to make a, a, as many meals out of that as we can. And what, you know, Jewish food, chicken soup, right? And the matzo ball, which, which right. was probably originally not matzo meal, right? Right, it was uh, a canedli, which became canedlach, and we call it a matzo ball, but it was made from leftover bread only seven days a week. I grew up in South Africa. The only time I ever saw a matzo ball in our traditional household was on Passover. That's when we had matzo balls. The rest of the year, if we had dumplings in soup, they were dumplings made from leftover starches and carbohydrates left in the kitchen. What would happen if you made knedlach from bread and put it in your soup? I'd get chased out of the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Gil, what, how do we take something which is so deep, feeding ourselves. The act of feeding ourselves is something which <clears throat> we can all do. We have control. It, it provides us with, with <coughs> not just sustenance, but comfort. Um, as restaurateurs, you want to nurture someone. You want to offer them absolute hospitality. You don't want to say no. So how does one go about changing the mind. How do you how do you evolve um, the, the message? How do you get people to go along with you I think on a, the ride? I think in a way you do it the way you nurture change anywhere, which is you offer per people an alternative that is more satisfying. That's in this case more flavorful, feels better. You know, it's not like you're hungry for 72 hours, but you know, decent interval. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're sitting right in the heart of a place that has done that for this country over the past 30 years, you know, starting with Chez Panisse up the street and many other restaurants in this area who've said, here's another way to eat. Um, the food is good. There's education that goes with it. There's a process of patient explaining. Uh, it ripples out slowly from here, probably bounces to the east, east coast, and then makes its way to the middle. And, you know, things that you could only find in Berkeley 25, 30 years ago, you find in St. Louis now. 
And even in Los Angeles. Even in Los Angeles. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the challenge, and we talked about this before with the restaurant, is that it puts, it puts a certain challenge on the, on, on the staff in the restaurant who have to be not just uh, servers, but knowledgeable food educators who can talk to people about it, who can answer questions. But the, the change happens in conversation. I have a friend who has it as his practice whenever he goes into a restaurant, and he's, he's a meat eater and he orders meat, but he will always ask the waiter, where is this from? Just very calmly. And the waiter will typically say, gee, I don't know. And uh, he'll say, well, can you ask the chef? And the waiter says, sure, goes back and asks the chef. The waiter and the chef come out. <laughs> and they have a conversation with my friend about the provenance of the meat. And you know, for four or five tables around, people are hearing that conversation. It's a very low key, very unobtrusive, but very effective kind of consciousness raising that you know, waiter, chef, food buyer, customers are all thinking thoughts they never thought before. But not all delis are Saul's in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And not all people, not all customers are customers who will ask, where is this meat from? So what do you say to the woman who wants her borscht in February on a cold, rainy day? Well, people are accustomed to taking abuse from waiters and Jewish delicatessens. <laughs> and I think the waiters are altogether too gentle at Saul's. <laughs> They're just, they just passively go along with whatever you want. Um, so, no, but I think seriously that there is a teaching function that goes on. I mean, if you want to get into this conversation about sustainability, um, there is uh, that it is incumbent upon the restaurateur uh, to teach uh, through the menu uh, and through the staff. The fact is you have a, a fairly stable staff. It seems people work there for a long time, so you have the opportunity to really train them to tell the story of the food. And I think Gil's right, you have the example from a couple doors down on Chaddock where, you know, nobody expects a tomato in the winter at Chez Panisse. Everybody's been very well trained. And, um, uh, and that the notion of eating seasonally is, uh, and part of that is they make, a, they make an event when something comes into the marketplace. It's a big deal when the first tomatoes show up, when the porcinis show up. When the, you know, and, and that, you know, I, I understand the need to have certain standbys at a Jewish deli, but there also could be a sense of occasion when something new. I mean, we, we've lost track of the fact that even meat, and we were talking in the green room, but eggs, these, are, these were seasonal foods. You know, beef was something you ate. I mean, if you're going to eat grass-fed beef, really the time to eat it is now, in the next couple months, when there's green grass. And you shouldn't be eating it. It's not seasonal in, in, in uh, the dry months here. Um, and eggs, we were talking about really, you know, until you have industrial production, they tend to slow down production in the, in the winter and not be as good in the winter. Um, chicken too, and uh, I shouldn't mention pork, but pork is a very seasonal food. It's best eaten in the fall. Um, but uh, so, you know, so kind of getting that sense of seasonality with meat too, uh, as well as produce, would be a, you know, an interesting experiment. And, but it would take some teaching. There, I, and I think there, we, we have all developed this expectation, I want it now, I want it you know, all year long, why, why can't I have this uh, this month if I had it last month? Um, and people don't know about seasonality. Um, but restaurateurs have played such an important role in this whole food revolution as the teachers um, that um, there's no reason that couldn't happen at this restaurant too. But even though people don't understand seasonality, I think everybody understands the difference between a summer and a winter tomato. You know, we're not starting from zero. People do know, oh yeah, that tomato that I ate in the summer or when I was a kid. And Having taught nutrition for years, I, I really agree that you really want to build on positive experiences because, you know, and that has to go hand in hand with the education. If it's a lot of talking, like we're doing tonight, um, <laughs> you know, it's just a bunch more information about, oh no, now I have to do this. Okay, I not only can't have that, I'd have to, you know, and it's just overwhelming, right? For those of us who care about what's going on in the world and want to do right, it can be very overwhelming. So I just really feel like we have to, you know, well, I'm volunteering in a kindergarten right now and I have a great idea, which is there, you know, you have a no thank you bite. 
And maybe you guys could start that. You what know? does that mean? <laughs> that means you take a bite even if you don't want it. <laughs> and then you see whether, you know, really, if you eat these foods, you go, oh, wow, that actually tastes wonderful. Your brain might not be saying. Okay, but in the deli? This is what I want. <laughs> no, you, you, in the deli setting, you would have a nice taste big. Tasters, you'd have you know? tasters. Mm -hmm. Tasters, yeah. tasters yes. or flights, flights of sandwiches. In like, flights like, of like, like, like the flights at Pyramid, you know? In addition to education, we would need sedatives. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Peter, I want to ask you, ha have there been foods that you've played with in the kitchen that are comfort foods that people really expect in a deli that using grass-fed or what you've been able to get um, that's ranched in a more sustainable way hasn't worked and you've been considering yanking it? Um, grass-fed is challenging. Corn. Uh, corn especially beef. for corned beef. Uh, we've had a uh, difficult three or four months working with Marin Sun Farms grass-fed corned beef. Uh, it's dry, it's crumbly, it's got, it's got some issues. And we don't know what those, what those are yet. We don't know what the solutions are yet. So um, I just want to ask a question then. A show of hands. If you could go to Saul's and have the best pastrami ever and feel totally guilt-free about eating it because you know that it's you know, beautifully sourced, but there was no corned beef on the menu, how many of you would be just enraged? Be, be honest. Be honest. <laughs> a few. A few. Not so bad. <laughs> How many would be sorely disappointed? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Reverse that question and make it the pastrami that's not available. Uh, no, not, not going there. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. The pastrami's not a problem. Perhaps the yeah. pastrami isn't a problem, is it? No. <laughs> Talk about the, the nature of the pastrami a, and why it's actually easier. There's a greater chance as a restaurant and anyone who's trying to start a Jewish deli, it's easier to get started perhaps with a smoker um, curing your own pastrami and smoking it in-house. Corned beef takes two or three weeks in brine in a refrigerated space. Restaurants just don't have that space. The chances of, and then the, the byproducts, maybe a salami, which we can't carry right now because we can't find one. If we had a smoke box, maybe we could come up with a homemade so, uh, Go salami. into that in more detail. What do you mean you can't carry salami? Why? We stopped carrying salami uh, two months ago. Um, we finally realized that, you know, Conagra owns Hebrew National. I mean, all the names that we we associate with Jewish Delhi must haves are not the old families that ran ran them anymore. They're not. Those names are now have been sold and they're owned by industrial food corporations, and. Um, uh, salami, Hebrew National, uh, is owned by Conagra. It's an industrial factory farm meat product. Um, and blind taste tested uh, against a salami that uh, you could make in your own kitchen that wouldn't stand up. Um, but because of FDA rules, we can't, there is no salami that we can get our hands on that we can sell in the restaurant. You can't move salami. Uh, from one address to another, unless it's been FDA inspected. So if you don't want to eat factory farmed uh, uh, Hebrew national salami, right now there is no other salami to serve. So we're waiting for either to have our own smoke house in the, in the restaurant or we'll make our own, uh, but it won't look or feel or taste any way like the product you've become accustomed to. And what's interesting is that we're down to Jewish kosher beef salami has become a single product. I mean, there's no variation whatsoever. And I think if anything reflects from your grandmother's kitchen, it would be salami. It would be different in every household, different in every community, different in every city. And we're down to one salami now. And it's not that tasty. <laughs> Let's talk about side dishes for a minute. Can I just say one last thing about that salami yeah. tube? That, that was very interesting to hear about. And, and you know, there has been this assumption, and most consumers still have it, that if, if a product is labeled kosher, it is somehow superior in every way. And the whole, there's a whole kosher marketplace based on this myth. And Hebrew National is a great example. And the, um, you know, we, we recently had an expose of a kosher slaughterhouse in, in Iowa, I think it was, um, that turned out to be one of the most brutal in the whole country. 
And, and this was a shock to people because there was this assumption that this is more ethical food as well. And, um, and I think in a way that word ethics is really where the, the Jewish deli, the Jewish part of the Jewish deli bumps into sustainability. And there's a whole conversation going on, of course, in, in, in about the kashrut and, and whether the, the ideas behind it are, have, are, have been hollowed out by industrialization of food or are they still vital and how might they be rewritten. Yeah. And, and there's been discussion about eco kashrut for some years now, yeah. about whether that should be incorporated into the standards. Yeah. Right. Yes, yeah, so people would ask us, is, is um, the pastrami kosher? No, it's, we like to think it's eco kosher, you know, but that doesn't really exist as Try a standard. beyond yet. kosher. That yeah. seems to work for a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel that the deli, the, the deli you imagine in your mind that you would love it to be is is exclusively Ashkenazi. Well, authentic, I mean, it's interesting, because authentic is, it wasn't really New York. It was Eastern European and, 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 and many different sources of Eastern European. And so authentic is, I mean, it's a diaspora cuisine, and, and the Jews have traveled many places, and if anything describes what the Jews have done, it's everywhere they go, they adapt the food. And, and I think there are many, many, many other cuisines that are that are part of this vernacular that are welcome in our deli anyway very controversial is it really controversial it really, it what, really what is about it? Yeah. well it's controversial in that you're supposed to have certain iconic dishes but you, the thing is you and you asked me what my dream is is that the menu would be smaller we couldn't have uh, we shouldn't have a four page menu we should have a two page menu and the other two pages can be rotated in and out, depending on season, depending on availability, and depending on the inspiration of the person who's running the kitchen, who's cooking that food every day. Is it still a Jewish deli? It's a Jewish eatery. Um. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think you said this before, that the deli has to be reimagined. I mean, it, it, there is nothing that stays the same, and the idea that it's going to stay in a hermetically sealed vacuum from the the past decades, it, it doesn't um, it, it doesn't it doesn't it's not where we came from. It's not where we're going. Um, food and memory are very are very you know tender, but food has become very like fraught and, and changeable. And I think we should be leading here, not um, not reacting. So do, do you get more objection to the notion of taking corned beef off the menu, or to the notion of putting Mediterranean salad or couscous or something? We've on never the discussed menu? corned beef publicly. This is the well, first time. <laughs> <laughs> And, and we're not taking it off the menu no, just yet. But, but, I mean, but, it's, but, it's, but it's the concern about losing things that people hold dear oh or, God, or yeah. bringing weird things onto the menu that they wouldn't find at Second Avenue It's more losing daily. things than weird things. In fact, we have the strangest menu. There's the sort of Ashkenazi stable menu, and then there's the specials, which is a huge menu that changes every day. And then there's the secret menu, which are giant sandwiches that we had in the past that you can still get. But we took them off because we thought they scared people. So there is, there is a, it's a gigantic menu. And, and it's taking things away, but we have a new thing. For instance, smoked fish became um, harder to get and more expensive, and we were bringing it over from the East Coast. And so now we just bring it over every so often, and we have um, a smoked fish alert, you know, an email that goes out to the people who are concerned. And there's a flunkin alert. And there's, there's a, a kishka flunkin? Flunkin flunkin alert. Flunkin alert. You can get on it. You can get on it if you like. And there's a, there's a kishka <laughs> alert. Because, you know, Someday and, and, and you, can, you can, so that way, when we do it, you know it's there, but it doesn't have to be there every day. But we talked about kishka earlier today, too. And kishka, I mean, I remember kishka as a kid. It was a completely different thing than what it is now. Now it's what, made in one factory for the whole U.S. and then sent out frozen? I think it's made in China. <laughs> Start that rumor. <laughs> so so do, 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 do you eaters, is it so important to you that you have that on the menu every day for the two times a year that you might want to eat it, um, even though it's this just poster child for industrialized food? No, you should say, you should be yelling, no, no, no Kishka. No. Happy were saying, what's Kishka? <laughs> mm, Kishka, I mean, we were talking about how great it would be. Kishka, describe what Kishka is. Let's have a little culinary interlude. <laughs> well, I think the, the memory yeah. of what yeah. Kishka is, Can it's a, historically, <laughs> it's a stuffed derma. So it's the neck skin of a goose, 
like if you lived in the shuttle and you were really poor and you happened to have a goose and you had already eaten the rest of the goose, you saved the neck and then you took the neck skin and you would cr cook a flour schmaltz um, Root. Onion. Yeah, binding. And you would put maybe some aromatics and some spices in it, and then you would sew it up in the, in the, in the, in the goose skin, and then braise that, or cook it you know, in the oven with a chicken or in the soup. And then you'd have a gravy, and you'd, you know, this is how you fed your family. You, you were hungry, and you didn't have a lot of money, and you, would, and you had things lying around, and you, you made use of every scrap that came from an animal. Um, and 19, 20, 30, 40, the Jews in New York moved to second, third generation, got wealthy, and became an industrialized product. And the frozen sausage, sausage skin stuffed with a flour, schmaltz, roux, uh, mm. and... <laughs> a lot you know, of salt. As far as the deli is concerned, 1950 onwards, the suburban deli just sourced this, frozen in a case. <laughs> sliced it and browned it and put a gravy on it, maybe the turkey gravy for the night or the au jus from the brisket or something. And I think that, by and large, few places can claim to serve a really tasty kishka on their menu. Uh, and, and we've just chosen not to serve it for the last 50, 15 years I've been at Souls. We just haven't carried it. We just don't sell it. But I imagine one could make a really tasty kishka. You had an idea for it. Oh, yeah, idea. I mean, I think it would be incredible. I would love to make a kishka now with chicken fat and really fine bulgur wheat mm. Mm. and mm -hmm. aromatics and put it in call fat, roll right. it in call fat. Or in chicken skin. Yeah. yeah or, or I mean, you could even make it like a patty. <laughs> let's just, let's just start, start talking about restaurants. <laughs> but it, it, the reality is for the chef of any restaurant, deli or restaurant, to make those wonderful specials and find those flavors and get them to your plate, they can't be carrying around with them the four or five pages, other pages on the menu that day. So you need to carve out a certain amount of time every day in a restaurant to give time for those specials, to make them tasty. And, then, yeah. and you know, I think that there is another perspective on seasonality that, that can really help. Having run a farm stand for years, which we're growing the food right here in the East Bay, we can only grow seasonally here. You know, we're not shipping in tomatoes from Mexico, for instance. And it did take a lot of education for our customers um, who would come and want whatever they wanted at whatever time of year. But the way that I have thought about it for years is that, you know, you really are waiting for this time, the time of the peas, you know. You are, you haven't had peas for six, eight months, and you almost cannot remember what peas taste like, you know, it was a long time ago. And then the winter peas are ripe, and you start eating them, and it's just this amazingly wonderful, mm -hmm. sensual experience of tasting this delicious vegetable that's at the height of flavor, it's, you know, it's grown at the right time, it is really the essence of that vegetable. And I know we're talking about meat here, but you guys obviously well, you know, herring a lot could of be that. You could have the herring festival. Exactly. In June. So it, it holds for the meats as well. And I think that it really actually enhances our enjoyment of these foods because it's such a special thing. And then you get sick of peas. You're sick of them. You're like, peas again, you know? When are these? And then they end. So then you wait till the next season. Can we talk about pickles? Yeah. Let's talk about pickles. <laughs> well, on any given day, we can get two comment cards. The one says, the pickles are too sour. And the other says, <laughs> where the half sours. And the thing that people have forgotten is that pickles are made from fresh cucumbers, which only grow locally June through, June, July, August, through October, November. And we now have, for the first time in our 15 years, three farmers, three farms, one in Modesto, one in Brentwood, and one in Sonoma, that grow cucumbers for Dave Erith, who makes these pickles in Healdsburg, and then ships them down to us. But guess what? In November, there are no more pickles to be had. Um, so what a Jewish, so the person who expects the half sour pickle, that open fermented pickle that's made from a fresh cucumber that's ready six, seven days later, and ready only up to 15, 20 days later, then after it's not a half sour pickle anymore, this, we, we've become ossified. The Jewish deli has to have a half sour pickle all year. Well, what happens in the middle of winter? There are no pickles close to New York or LA or Berkeley. I don't so. want to hear anybody complaining about your pickles not being available. The fact that they're able to get those pickles 
Source, to, I mean, I'm, I'm now jealous. I know, and I think that's, <laughs> see, but that's a great story. I've never heard that story in all my years of coming there. That, that, you know, that these, I mean, I had no idea that they were actually local pickles uh, made in Healdsburg. And um, uh, so I, I would encourage you to do a little more storytelling, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and have a, se have a season of the local pickles and a season of the other pickles, because you still the have to have pickles. The pickle, the the pickle, pickle, pickle week. <laughs> you know, I look forward to pickle week next June. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're talking about tradition, and this is much more traditional than the so-called Jewish deli. You know, my bubby, if you talk to her about having cold borscht in the winter, she'd throw you out of the house. It's crazy. Why would you want to do that? You know, it was just obvious to people. You know, you ate what was there, what was appropriate for the time. You didn't try to have the same thing year-round. The pickles would come in, the peas would come in. I remember as a kid growing up in New York in the 50s that sweet corn would show up in the summertime, and there'd be a glut of sweet corn for a, f a few weeks, I think, and it's all we would eat. Didn't expect it any other time. Didn't want to eat it in the winter. Didn't... So, you know, what's the tradition that we're trying to preserve? Is it, you know, is it, this, like you say, is this ossified, frozen snapshot in time of this weird moment in human history, or is it this way of living with the earth and with our culture and with our families? That Unfortunately, changes? it's the weird moment in human history when most of us have grown up. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and so that, that it becomes a personal history that informs your own personal story and your, your, your own family. And, and that's, that's where it, it butts heads. I'm curious to know, do, do you get fewer, I don't want to say complaints, but fewer questions about the changes from younger people? Is it generational? Not, not strictly, because I think a lot of people come in to, to replicate what they learn. And this is, this is what home is, this is who I am. But I, I think, yeah, there's all, a lot of people get it and a lot of people don't want to talk about it in the deli? I would say it depends. Uh, Dr. Brown's soda bottles, mm -hmm. our age and older, um, whereas the younger generation is more than excited to yeah. taste the soda. We don't get it right every day. You know, it's now inconsistent because a human being's making each glass of soda. Don't um, believe him, it's delicious. Oh, it's so <laughs> good. Um, you know, but, but the fact that the celery, the celery tonic soda is not in this green bottle, which is quite unique, that's what people find so insulting. They, they've forgotten the fact, they don't read the artificial ingredients on the label and how wonderful a celery tonic can be if you just take celery seeds and toast them and extract the flavor into a syrup with vodka and then add seltzer water and ice. Um, but you're missing the bottle, so it's not the same experience anymore. Um, so it's, it's tricky. You know, yeah. But we wind up giving a lot of free taste because once you, I mean, the way to get somebody to accept it is like, it's okay, it's okay, just try it. If you don't like it, you don't have to pay for it. You know, it's like, it's really, no You have to be hurt. a different mom. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But before we go to questions, I, I want to ask something though. The salmon, smoked salmon, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with lox? Salmon is such a fraught fish. Yeah. I try, we try it to always ask all our employees, all our servers, to use the word, the phrase smoked salmon, not lox, because lox is not smoked, and it is fraught. It's people forgotten, you know, Nova Scotia comes up, I want Novi, doesn't exist, you know, we're far from Nova Scotia, this wild salmon doesn't exist in Nova Scotia anymore, the Manhattanites ate it out, you know, fished it out. Um, we shouldn't be taking any salmon from the ocean right now, period. We can, we're not allowed to, it's not legal. Um, so you, we, sh we, we must use farm salmon for smoked salmon. It's the right thing to do, I think, for now. Um, same as trout. We use smoked trout from farms in Idaho. They're sustainable farms. You should not be taking trout, the last few out of the water right now, and wild streams. Um, so we only offer one kind of smoked salmon, mm -hmm. and it's farmed. Um, and yeah, I, there's nothing, I, I think we've gotten over that one. It's been five years, six years. Do, you, do any of you want to ask questions of each other before we turn it over? Um, well, I guess I would just ask Peter and Karen this, that, that if you're selling comfort food, even in a community like this, which is so enlightened about food, is it, is it perhaps true that people are more conservative when they're in that mood. In other words, they just want it as it was before. I mean, I'm just thinking as I, as I listen to you and I compare what you're doing to, you know, the, the other restaurants around you, but I realize when you're in the mood for comfort food, you may not want 
to be educated. You may not want yeah, it's not strictly any, polite. Any yeah. ethical or political complications. Mm -hmm. You just want what you had when you were a kid. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, the first angry emails I got when this email went out announcing this event were from my parents, who um, <laughs> <laughs> who you're like, ooh, really? You know, shouldn't shouldn't we just you know get real? You know, when people want comfort, they just want comfort. And, and, and that's true, but I have this idea that, you know, especially the Jewish people have been kind of scrappy and, and leaders progressively, and I, I, I think that we can do that here, too, and, and um, that there is something comfort, that we hunger for, for more than just pastrami, and that we hunger for meaning and community, and, and, and I think, you know, a little bit of that slipped in is probably good. Okay, I'm going to start asking some questions. Do you know of any other Jewish studies who are following your lead? Um, we, we they, I think there are a few. Um, young folks are starting delis, I think, in Brooklyn, a place like that, where they have 10 things on the menu, 10 items on the menu. They make everything themselves, and they're, they're more interested in sourcing, so they kind of know where everything comes from. And they'll have, they'll deal, with, deal immediately. They'll deal with seasonality. So I've heard of one sort of hole in the wall in Brooklyn. I have heard that there's a pastrami or a matzo ball truck somewhere in LA that twitters. Um, there's some folks up in Portland that are, are trying to make everything themselves. Um, but I Yet think their sandwiches are still huge. They're still stuck with the, the big menu problem. You know, they haven't extracted themselves from that problem. Um, but otherwise, no, not yet. Just, you have to remember that there are very few delis left. We're talking about, I can name them on these fingers right here. LA, New York, um, Chicago. The, there's very few of us left. Oh, I don't want to cry. <laughs> um, what's the role of food in sustaining culture? Is the destruction of culture really sustainable? Wait, say that again? Let's go with the second part of this. Kind of a blue book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is the destruction of culture really sustainable? Perhaps someone is saying that you're destroying culture. Um. Okay, next question. <laughs> there, can I there, say something about that, actually? Yes, you can. You know, um, I think it's, it's unrealistic to think that culture is a static Thing. Um, I can understand, again, we've been talking about comfort and these are comfort foods and we all have our, you know, hope that things, certain things will never change, you know, and that's an emotional response. But um, I ask myself the question, what is more important now? Because I don't know, you know, I'm trying not to get overwhelmed by it. I don't want to bury my head in the sand. But we really do have some very stark and grave problems, you know, that we're facing, including global climate change, um, other environmental issues, labor issues, and food is a nexus of all of these Absolutely. things. And, and so, health. And health. And so for me, as a farmer, as somebody who's worked in low-income communities, where again, those communities are impacted by the food system, for instance, the Port of Oakland, there's a, a residential community there and the food is shipped through there and they have asthma and they have diseases and they, you know. So at what price are we going to hold on to these com comforts or can we have some of it and not go too over? Tradition shouldn't erode people's lives. I mean, we shouldn't hang on to tradition to the detriment of, of ourselves. True, and isn't there something comforting about working to wake up and working to change things? And, and isn't there some great comfort in gathering and knowing that that's part of what you're doing? Remember that you should keep that on a little note in your pocket yeah. when you're having a difficult moment in, in the restaurant. Um, it sounds like there's a, this is another question. It sounds like there's a real disconnect then between what most consumers want and folks who support sustainable who su support the sustainable food movement. What will Saul's do to address this disconnect? Between what people want and the sustainability movement? Yeah, they're making an assumption that most consumers don't really care about sustainability, I think. Well, first, I don't think that's true. I mean, I think it's certainly not true at Saul's. Um, and in this town, and I, don't, I just don't think that's true. I think there's some resistance, but I ultimately don't think that's true. 
Uh, look, look at how diets and food consciousness have changed in, you know, in so this country much. over the past several decades. It's, you know, it, it's not universal, it's not everywhere, but what's taken for granted, what people ask about, what people like to eat, the variety that you see in restaurants and in supermarkets, the organic sections in mainstream supermarkets, and on and on, because you know, of you know, Michael's work and Alice's work and other people's work, it really has shifted. And you know, change does happen. It happens slow and imperfectly and fitfully, and so you can look at the glass being half empty and say, oh my god, you know, it's just all terrible where you can see that this thing evolves. Food, food is, a, is one of the most conservative things in people's lives. Uh, people are slow to change on that. They're slow to adopt uh, n new, new regimes. But it happens, and it happens through taste and delight, uh, which these folks do. Uh, and it happens through education, but not like standing over you and giving you a lecture while you're having your pastrami sandwich. It has to be gentle and unobtrusive and light. And, you know, and the notion of giving choices you know, the, the, you know, the taste tests or maybe giving people the choice of the two different kinds of celery soda and saying, hey, try them both. What do you think? Tell your friends. It's, a comparative you know, tasting of sodas. But that's, that's what we've been living in, and it ripples out from here. Um, it's absolutely true. I mean, we just have to remember again that, you know, our tradition, what, what we think is traditional is not traditional. The tradition is change. And it evolves. And it doesn't stick in a moment in time. And if it did, there wouldn't be Jewish delis. There wouldn't be Jews, frankly. That's true. This is a good one. I like this one, this question. Will meat, even if it is grass-fed, always be at the center of deli food? Or will our culture and awareness evolve to choosing a more plant-based, maybe healthy, plant-based, sustainable diet? Well, I think, I mean, I think that people will be eating a lot more meat in the future because we, we simply can't. I mean, when we say it's unsustainable, we don't just mean we don't like it. I mean, it can't go on. Because you mean less meat, you said more. Less, yeah, and the amount of meat people are eating. People eat, on average, nine ounces of meat per person per day. Uh, that's 200 pounds of the stuff every year. If the whole world ate meat at that rate, we would need, according to World Watch, 2.3 more worlds. I mean, it's incredibly resource intensive and incredibly productive of greenhouse gases. And, you know, what we need to do is create some new food traditions where meat is an accompaniment, is a flavoring, is, um, or used the way that an earlier tradition we've alluded to. Because there, we're ta there are two traditions in a way. There's the post-war, you know, Cadillac sandwich that we've been, you know, that we were looking at. And then there was the, the earlier, poorer tradition of using every little bit of the bird. And um, and eat you know what about that tradition? I mean you know no one's standing up for the the um, pacha. Yeah, and all those bits of chickens that I didn't think you could eat, and um, and I didn't grow up eating, but my but my mother grew up eating, um, and so you know in a way that's a more sustainable tradition, um, you know using the whole animal like that. So uh, I think we you know you, you you pick and choose from traditions and you construct something new out of the out of the elements of them, but, but meat, that, that big chunk of animal protein in the middle of the plate, you know, I think we'll look back on that as a, as a kind of a post-war aberration. And it's also important to understand that how our food is produced, that uh, in the world of farming, you really need animals. You really need animals to provide the nutrient to continue growing your vegetables. So what you're saying, Michael, is really right, because we need the animals, they're part of the system of farming, but we need to be consuming them more as a condiment, an accompaniment. Um, so I think there's another side that some people may take, which is do away with all the meat. And that doesn't work in our food system either, to, in my opinion. Um, I don't think we can have a sustainable food system that eliminates animals. Explain which part. Why is the vegetarianism not sustainable? Oh, well, um, <clears throat> I'm not saying that vegetarianism isn't sustainable for some people or that people couldn't choose that lifestyle, but in terms of farming, as we're talking about growing grains and growing vegetables and our staple crops, um, we, you constantly have to add nutrients to the soil to continue to grow those crops. You can add some nutrients by growing green manures or other methods, but with the population we have on the planet now, um, there just isn't enough land, and actually using animals in a farming system creates a closed loop 
if it's done correctly, where you have animals that um, provide the manure, and some of them are eaten, oftentimes the males, and, uh, <laughs> and then... No, I, underst I understand your point, and, and I'm not saying that people need have to eat animals. I'm just saying I do not see a farming system without animals being a part of it. See, the, the, and the, that, the, and the, the choice of what you eat is a personal choice personal of what you choice. eat, but if, the, yeah. but if the model for sustainable agriculture mm -hmm. is living systems and the 3.8 billion years of ecosystems on Earth, the way they work is with an interchange of plants and animals. Now, the proportion has to be very different than what we have now, but that's the way living systems work. That, that cycle is part of the deal. So I, I understand that. So if we think okay. if we're advocating for less meat, I still don't understand why we don't advocate for no meat, but still keeping animals as part of the animal. This is, I think, going in depth into that topic is a different panel. Okay. Yeah. So let's, that's Thank okay. Thank you. It is a good Thank question. Thank you for your passion. <laughs> well, also, uh, a lot of people eating no meat works very well. Yeah, well, That's yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge help. Um, why can't pastrami, a huge pastrami sandwich, be a loss leader? <laughs> Please. It you is know, people, a loss leader. <laughs> consumer eaters do have no idea of the economics of restaurants, really. The more, the more pastrami sandwiches we serve, the less healthy our business is. Hmm. And that applies to all delis today. Yeah, it's economically unsustainable at a time when any restaurant that's still open after the last year should get a medal, I think. You know, hamburgers are, are lost leaders at McDonald's and most fast food outlets who make that's their money on the soda and the french fries. Um, so we do have that model. It doesn't work that well for anybody. Here's a really nice comment, I think. The food is only 50% of the deli. The other 50% is the social function. It's a secular synagogue. <laughs> that's really good. That's... Um, what, what I'm curious about, and, and, and maybe somebody who knows out there can raise your hand, I wonder if other traditional culturally based cuisines are having this much difficulty mm -hmm. in making switches to more sustainable um, practices in restaurants. There was a story in the East Bay Express about six months ago about the failure of soul food restaurants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. there, there, there was an article in the East Bay. It was a front page story saying all the soul food restaurants are having huge problems. Soul food restaurants are having huge problems surviving because they're not healthy. Well, they're considered maybe unhealthy. Maybe they're not healthy or maybe because it costs too much. I don't know. But the fact yeah. of the matter is, there's something really happening. Yeah, I, I, would, I would imagine that. that Meat portions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, and it's so ironic because when you think about pork, sus, the whole sustainable movement is advocating for a richer, more fatty animal rather than a lean animal. Why is that ironic? Because when you think of health, oh, you automatically go mistake. to that. Of we, course yeah. it's a mistake. Yeah. Well, that's a question for Peter and Karen. Why no pork? I mean, that seems, I mean if you're pushing the envelope at, at, that three, deli, traditions. at that deli in Portland, they have a huge crab festival every year. <laughs> is that just a uh, bridge too far there? Uh, yeah, so I think, far, yes. I think okay. yeah. We'll just leave it at so far, yes. <laughs> so no bacon? You don't Doors serve open. bacon? Yeah. No. Never bacon. served bacon, <laughs> shellfish. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. But cheese with meat. Cheese with meat. Somehow it's okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> would, would, would everybody like to just, do you have anything in your mind that you'd like to just leave us with? Some fabulous pithy remark. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Will, Willow, do you, would you do you ever come to to Saul's and think, I have all these beautiful vegetables. I'd love him to make a coleslaw that was mm -hmm. not just cabbage. Absolutely not. I love the coleslaw as it is. Don't, <laughs> Don't mess with my coleslaw, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess. Um, 
I don't know if this is pithy or not, but I was thinking about how in, you know, we're talking about Jewish culture here, and for me, I, you know, I wasn't really raised, um, my father wasn't very religious, and I, I missed out on a lot of the Jewish cultures, but, or cultural traditions, but one thing that I think was transmitted to me is this idea that not only do you have to, or do you want to try to live your life by the commandments, you know, do no harm and be a good person, but you also have to go out and do good. And so for me, that's really important. And I actually, I feel so happy and lucky that I have this deli that I can come to and have delicious comfort food, but also feel that I can stick to my principle of wanting to eat sustainably raised meat, especially. And it's very difficult to eat in restaurants if you have that commitment. Yeah. Yeah, could I, I'd like to add something to that. I mean, I totally um, second what Willow's saying. And, and just to add that I think that um, what Peter and Karen is, is doing is very, very important. And I think represents the kind of the next wave of this, this food revolution that's happening. I mean, we have figured out how to do expensive, sustainable food. Um, we have, you know, I hear all the time, isn't this an elite movement? Um, how are we going to make this kind of food available to everyone? And it's when sustainably raised food gets into delis and taquerias and diners that you begin to extend the benefits in terms of health, in terms of the, the pleasure of eating food you, you, you can feel good about morally and ethically to everyone. Um, is, you know, that's what I think is very important. That's why I'm here tonight, is to support that effort, the democratization of the food movement, which I think is going on in this restaurant. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think one of the ways that, that happens is by us, by economic support for these changes. You know, we vote with our dollars. Every time we drop a dollar on a counter, we're voting for a future. You know, and it's a future that goes one way or another way. Every single purchase we make, we don't just vote every two years or every four years. We vote every day, several times a day. And we get to choose what we're voting for. If we vote for the kinds of alternatives that are more sustainable and maybe more expensive, part of the job is to bring them to scale. Uh, one of the reasons they're expensive is that they are small and specialized and elite. And as there becomes more of these, and as we learn how to do them better, they get more economical and they get more reach. So, you know, Peter and Karen have their job in the restaurant. We have our job as voters dropping dollars on counters every day. Yeah, really well said. <laughs> Any thoughts you'd like to leave us with besides let's eat? <laughs> yeah, I'm hungry. Well, just that, um, the Jewish deli cuisine, I think, needs to reach back into the past and, and connect us all to those stories. That's why we go there. But it, I think it's time to connect to our future. And, and we're here to ask permission to do that and, um, and that no one will leave hungry. So. <laughs> I want to thank everybody. Peter? Uh, just to echo that with the ingredients, we've, you know, we've spent many years playing with our ingredients and searching for alternatives and local and sustainable and often reached back to before 1950 where we think we've, we're getting foods that, are served in the, that were served in the Jewish table before 1950 and we ask that everybody help us on that journey and keep going back past beyond 1950 before 1950 and uh, the food will remain delicious hopefully. Thank you so much for Thank inviting you. me up here to do this. It's been really wonderful, a conversation that I've never had with anyone before. Really nice. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.